Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Jonas. I'm the Director of Communications with the National Association for Business Economics. We're pleased to present today's event, which is co-hosted by the Atlanta Economics Club. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to mention a few other upcoming NAEB events, uh, including our uh, new webinar series, Perspectives on the Pandemic, which will continue next week. This is a series that will feature leading voices and economic thought leaders sharing their insights with NAEB members. So next week's installment which will feature Barry Eichengreen. That'll take place on Tuesday, May 19th at 2 p.m. And the following week, we'll have a conversation with Raj Chetty from Harvard, who will be sharing some of his latest research on the pandemic. As a reminder, registration for the pandemic series is free for all NAVE members. If you're not a member of NAVE and are interested in joining, please go to nave.com slash join. A few other upcoming events that will be free and open to the public. Uh, tomorrow, we will have, uh, that's May 14th, we'll host a webinar on the current state of the North American auto industry. This Friday, May 15th, we'll host a Tech Economics Roundtable webinar featuring recent academic research on the impact of social distancing. And on Monday, May 18th, we'll host another update on the labor market, looking at the latest jobs data and policy prescriptions. As a reminder, all recordings of webinars are available on the NAEB Connect app, which can be downloaded in the App Store and through Google Play. NAEB members can also access webinar recordings through the digital archive on NAEB.com. Okay, now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event. Jessica Dill is president of the Atlanta Economics Club, and she's also director of the Center for Housing and Policy with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Jessica, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Chris. Um, thank you all for tuning into today's webinar, which, as Chris mentioned, was brought to you um, through a partnership between the Atlanta Economics Club and NAVE. For those that aren't aware, the Atlanta Economics Club is one of NAVE's 42 active local chapters. We've been around since 1972, and we typically meet on an in-person um, in -person and monthly basis, September through May. We were fortunate to be able to leverage our long-standing relationship with the Southeast Regional Office of the BLS, which is located in Atlanta, to secure Commissioner Beach as our closing speaker for our 2019-2020 season um, here right now in May. Clearly, our, our program committee had impeccable timing and foresight when they booked commis the commissioner last July. Um, I joke, of course, but in all seriousness, we couldn't have timed this, this speaking engagement any better um, given the heightened concern and uncertainty around labor markets due to COVID-19. And we're very grateful to have Commissioner Beach with us here today. Um, Commissioner Beach became the 15th commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics in March 2019 before joining the BLS he was vice president for policy research at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Prior to that he held several distinguished positions including chief economist for the Senate Budget Committee, a fellow and director of the Center for Data Analysis at the Heritage Foundation, a senior economist at Sprint, and president of the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University. Dr. Beach holds a master's degree in econ from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and a PhD in econ from Buckingham University in Great Britain, where he's still a visiting fellow today. Commissioner Beach will share some of the innovative steps that the BLS has taken to collect and produce top-notch data and insights on the economy. He'll also share the latest on how the economy has been impacted by COVID-19, spotlighting some of the industries that have been most affected. As Chris mentioned, er, Actually, please submit your um, questions throughout the duration of the commissioner's prepared remarks. Um, we've earmarked a fair amount of time at the end, and so we're looking forward to um, Q&A and that discussion. Without further ado, I'd like to virtually pass the mic to Commissioner William Beach. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jessica, and um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chris, and everyone who put this program together. Uh, yes, when uh, we said uh, we'll do this back in July, we had we just really had no idea what kind of momentous and historic period we'd be, we would be in. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is the single largest collapse of labor markets in U.S. history, and uh, we're in the midst of it, right? We're, do we know where it's going? Uh, I don't know that anyone really does, but we do have some pretty good data, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, BLS, about how we're collecting our data, what sort of challenges we are facing. I'm sure that the economists on this call are interested in that particular question. Uh, then I'll also share some um, insights into the labor market and do a few other things and we'll 
as Jessica mentioned, we'll leave plenty of time for uh, questions uh, later on. So uh, thank you again for inviting me. It's just a real pleasure to be here. I'd rather be there in Atlanta. It's one of my favorite places. I would rather be with you in person, but this is, uh, this is second best. Uh, so let me just start off with the key takeaway from the entire presentation I'm going to give you in the next 15 or so minutes. BLS is open for business. Uh, we may have missed a step or two. Um, we may be missing some details in the price indexes, and, but by and large, we're functioning at 100%. We're, uh, everyone is working remotely. We're getting our work done. And I'm really happy and very proud of the organization for the nimbleness and the agility that it has shown in getting all of that done. You know, in the midst of all of these changing and challenging moments, uh, we're getting our work done. We're, we're continuing what we are supposed to do for the public service. So let me start off. I have several questions I want to sort of answer. Uh, and the first one deals with our field operations. Uh, uh, the Atlanta region is a, is a wonderful place for field op operations. That's where we do our jolts work. And uh, they've been doing just fine. So as you know, we collect data in a number of different ways uh, in our surveys. We have, uh, most famously, we have the surveys of, on the labor market side, uh, the survey of establishments, the survey of households, and we have all of these price index surveys that we do as well. Uh, and, and much of our data um, needs to be collected in person. And that's, I guess we've, in a sense, become internationally known for the quality of the in-person uh, surveys. But as of mid-March, I brought everybody out of the field. Um, we halted all in-person collection for prices, for uh, the demographics of the labor market, and for the establishment survey and switched our focus uh, entirely to phone, email, and internet interactions with our respondents. Um, now that doesn't say that we didn't have any effect from that. You know, the in-person survey, particularly if you're doing prices, is really important. You go in, you look at something, you turn it over, you get the characteristics, uh, you look at the prices around that product, but that can't be done now. And, and obviously we're doing it for a very good reason because the safety uh, of our uh, respondents and of our employees really trumps uh, everything else. So to overcome these challenges, we've had to be agile and we've expended, uh, expanded our use of a lot of high-tech tools that we really <laughs> didn't think we would be doing. Uh, for example, uh, video collection, uh, that's just not been done before. And uh, we're doing okay, not, on, not in every category, but in most categories. Uh, we give our employers and our households many different options on how they are to respond to the surveys. We, we can, of course, call people on the telephone. And oddly enough, uh, as you'll find out, I think I have this in my remarks, our housing survey, is uh, the response rate on that is really good. And why? Because people are, are home. And when the phone rings, it's something to do, right? Normally, you don't talk to the government. But now they're, now they're giving us their time, and that's wonderful. Uh, we're, for, for the first time uh, ever, we're allowing key economic data, which has come from the regions to the national headquarters for processing, we're allowing that to be reviewed and finalized remotely. What's one of, one of the most remarkable but unseen things about the last several months at BLS is we've been doing all of this work in a remote posture, in a telework platform. Uh, you know, prior to this, we didn't really encourage, in fact, we discouraged uh, having the data, which is co confidential, protected by law, going through the publicly switched system. And we still don't allow that, but we do have a way of getting the data to households where our employees are working. Um, access to these data remain limited to a few people, and all the data are stored on secure servers that require multiple levels of authentic authentication. But the bottom line is that we're getting gold standard results, good statistical work in a remote posture. And I'm, I'm really thrilled by that. Some people say, well, why should we come back to work? I think we are losing a few, a few steps along the way, but nothing that I don't, I think even the experts out there would notice. So let me now turn to, so what are some of the distinct challenges that we're, that we're facing in the uh, data collection area? 
And in this, um, in this segment, I want to really highlight just a few, kind of four instances of the challenges that we're facing. And, and each of the examples, each of these four examples, uh, are, are a little different and give you a, a sense of how we have adapted to COVID-19 and the pandemic. You know, the idea is to do our work, do it with the same standards and quality assurances that we've normally done it, but do it in a remote or a telework platform. So example number one um, is the BLS Electronic Data Interchange Center, which is in Chicago. Uh, this is the EDI, Electronic Data Interchange Center, uh, which we use to accept large uh, data files, uh, principally from the uh, current uh, establishment survey, about 50, a little bit more now, of 50% of our data for the, house, for, for the establishment survey, the survey of businesses, which of course tears up to the number of jobs and all the detail by industrial uh, classification. Most of all the a little bit more than 50% comes in through this EDI in Chicago. And it's there that we also tear up the quarterly census of employment and wages. For those who use, use the QCEW know that that's a, a, a census and not a survey. And it covers about 97% of all establishments in, in the United States. In this particular case, I'm very happy to say that the staff were 100% telework ready. So moving to a telework platform of a posture went very, very smoothly. We didn't experience any disruption in our work. So I think that's gonna continue as long as the establishments are turning in their data, the larger ones, this, this I think it's almost close to 53% now, uh, that data will be just fine. The second example uh, was the, uh, was more of a challenge. Uh, BLS uses four data collection centers located in the regions uh, throughout the United States uh, for our jolts and uh, for the rest of the current establishment survey, uh, which is for, you know, for smaller firms. Uh, in, in, this, in this particular case, if you went to one of these regional headquarters and were allowed to walk through, which I don't know that you'd be allowed to do, but suppose theoretically you could, you would see people sitting in cubicles talking to these businesses. They'd be asking questions. Uh, how many people did you hire this last month? How many people left? What was your, what was your uh, average wage um, for this particular thing or for that particular thing? And, and these relationships go back years in some cases between the person who's doing the survey and the establishment. These offices are largely, strat, uh, uh, are largely staffed by contractors. And unfortunately, these were not telework ready. Uh, so we really had to hustle here. To respond to this cri crisis, we, we began quickly moving uh, employees, or contractors in this case, to telework. And we had to close these sites, these four sites. Now, this meant that we had to find computers for everybody. Um, and we opened up closets we hadn't opened up for a long time at BLS and found computers that were at, uh, salvageable. Some of them didn't have power cords, uh, and uh, all of them had to be cleaned in order to get the current software on there. But we've now been able to get all of those contractors, all of that operation, back up into a telework posture. So we're, we're okay now. But that was, that was a big push for the first few weeks of our telework platform uh, period, which goes back to March 16th. Uh, thirdly, another challenge is working with the state. So, I mean, this is a partnership which has so many benefits, but it also has a bunch of challenges, unique, unique circumstances. We have a very robust federal state program. You probably know this through the labor market information offices, which are in each state. And we do a lot of work with the states. And in fact, we provide the states, the state operations, with a lot of equipment and a lot of training. Well, many of these states simply shut down uh, key offices and sent those employees home. So we, we were right from the start on these local, these, that operation. We were in uh, some very severe challenges. Uh, one of the many innovations that have come about from this uh, is 
understanding better the technical needs of the states. This has been in the headlines through the UI system, but we've been working very, very closely to bring up that technical level so that state operations are, op are, are more efficient and uh, using the current equipment. That continues. That's an endeavor which I don't think we're going to be over for a long, long time. Uh, now, one, one of the nice innovations that's come out of this uh, is the access which we have made, and a great deal more than we ever had before, uh, to the LMI shops themselves. Uh, I have spent a lot of time in the past two months, uh, in the evenings largely, talking with uh, LMI directors uh, in the big states largely, uh, even, well, there's some small, smaller states too, but I, I have weekly conf conferences with New York and, and uh, 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 California, New Jersey, Michigan, to find out how those states are doing, processing their UI claims, uh, analyzing their the changes and the dynamics in their labor force, uh, particularly recently talking about how the PUA program has been uh, unfolding. This is the program for those who, who are not qualified for unemployment insurance because they're not in the payroll tax system, they're in the self-employed system. So that's been, been great, and I hope that that continues after this emergency is over. And finally, my fourth example is um, the DLS works very closely with state partners and, and other government agencies, and the other government agencies part is my example number four. Uh, for example, we have a lot of uh, joint projects with the Census Bureau. It's just amazing. I think the last time that Ron Jarman and I counted the number of programs. He's the deputy director of the Census Bureau. I think we had 39 projects that we do together. Of course, the most uh, uh, famous project uh, is the current population survey. Uh, we pay for uh, census employees to go out and speak, speak to 60,000 households per month for the uh, current pop population survey. They, we also employ or pay the Census Bureau to collect data for our consumer expenditure survey and our time use survey. The Census Bureau's National Processing Center provides call center, mail processing, data capture, imaging, and scanning services for BLS and for many other statistical agencies. And it was uh, a challenge, to say the least, for all of these agencies. When that center in Jefferson, uh, one of two centers, the, the center in Jefferson in uh, Bill, Indiana, closed in mid-March. Uh, they have done a good job, that is census, in replacing in-person contacts with tele telephone surveys, but the truth of the matter is we're, as a statistical system, still challenged by what census is having to under, undergo. And on top of all of that, they're, they're collecting the decennial census, so their, their attention is somewhat split at this particular time. So these are a few of the challenges that we faced. Um, I think they exemplify the agility of, of uh, BLS. Um, and we want to be honest, we haven't overcome all these challenges at the, at the level that I would like to overcome. But again, this is an unusual circumstance. So let me turn to another question. Um, how has COVID-19 impacted our response rates? Everybody wants to know this. Uh, it's a heavily covered topic in the press. Uh, we understand these are really difficult times for people, for businesses. Uh, a lot of businesses are simply closed. Uh, there, are, there are many people who are now disconnected from their place of work, so we've lost track of those if they were in our surveys. And we're going to be respectful of people and their circumstances and not, you know, not bug them. If, if we can't get a hold of them, we're going to try something else. As I've just mentioned, we're doing a pretty good job so far. Uh, so in this environment, this means recognizing that it will be difficult to get data from certain businesses, particularly hospitals, grocery stores, uh, those organizations that are notoriously busy at this, at, at this particular juncture. And just as I, as I mentioned, many of these businesses are simply not available, especially the small and medium-sized companies. So, so our response rates will suffer, and we have had... We, we have had response rates that have been a little bit lower than what we had hoped they would be. Uh, we, can, we can see the immediate impact of halting in-person surveys and, and interviews um, in, the, in the data collection 
side of the business. And let me just highlight a few. Let's turn to the consumer price index. Uh, for example, in March of, of 2019, that's last year, seems like a century ago, doesn't it? 67% uh, of non-housing data collected by uh, for the consumer price index was conducted in person. That's two thirds. In March of this year, only 37% of interviews were conducted in person. Um, and in April, we conducted no in-person data collection at all for the CPI. While a decrease in in-person interviews is realized, we observed an increase in other data collection modes, namely online. If we, uh, if we were thinking back to the period before the high quality internet system, which we have today, if this had happened back, uh, this pandemic had happened back in the 1980s, we'd, we'd be very, very difficult situation right now. But online has really saved the day. Response rates for some programs have, in, have declined. In April, we were able to collect 66% of CPI prices for goods and services. A year earlier, we were at 86%. So you can see the response rate dropped by 20 percentage points there. Uh, the response rate for the current population survey, the household survey for labor market activity in March of 2020 uh, was 73%, and in April it was 70%. Uh, that compares to a normal response rate of 83%. Uh, in contrast to the current, in, uh, in, uh, in contrast to that, the establishment survey has been holding up very, very nicely. Uh, we collected about 75% um, of uh, data the, for, the, for the first round of three rounds for April. And my guess is by the time we get to the second revision of the April numbers, you, you may know that we announced the number, it's revised the first time, and then it's revised the second time in two months in a row. By the time we get to that second revision, we may be up in the 90% range, which we're, we're, where we normally are. And I think that's because our large data collection in Chicago is holding up through telework and we are getting a better than expected res responses in the smaller uh, surveys, smaller business surveys that we're doing. I want to also say, and reassure everybody that even though response rates are down in the price indexes and down in the household survey, though not down in yet in the establishment survey, uh, every statistic we have been publishing uh, meets the statistical standards. Uh, we, have, we have, in fact, in some of the price series, not been able to find some products, and I've simply just suppressed those, but they're not in major products lines yet. Uh, we, have, uh, we have traditional methods of adjusting data for non-response. We're using those. Uh, we're also looking into changes in sampling and estimation that may be needed uh, due to the unique circumstances. We are keeping everybody informed, and I hope you've been able to see this through Q&A pages on our website. The Q&A uh, for the uh, employment report runs 11 pages, and it's almost as long for the CPI and the PPI. So we are trying to keep everybody up to date. Uh, lower response rates may result in fewer detailed statistics in the future. We can't, if the, the pandemic closed down, the shutdown uh, continues at this level, we are going to be looking at some different challenges for June. Uh, but I think we're in the field right now uh, in, in May in both the establishment and the household survey. And I think things are looking pretty good right now. Just briefly, let me turn to what our data show about the effect of COVID-19 on the economy. You, you'll get better answers from other economists than you will from me, but uh, we published just recently a uh, sort of a snapshot of who we thought would be affected by COVID-19, which parts of the labor market. 20.4% of all workers are employed in industries most immediately affected by the COVID-19 shutdown. And we're certainly seeing this in the pattern of UI initial claims. Uh, Nevada, Hawaii, Florida, South Carolina, um, <clears throat> and are, are, are states with, with high exposures. 
Uh, this concentration is uh, due to these states' high share of employment in the travel and tourism of a business. Besides affecting uh, in unemployment in these, in these jobs, the shutdown orders have had direct impact on sectors that provide inputs to the directly affected sectors so that we're seeing primary effects and we're also seeing secondary effects. We've also seen that occupations with lower wages are more common in the shutdown sectors than those with higher paying wages. I wonder how long that will continue. Uh, uh, even though the initial hit with, with those with overall a little bit lower in the income profile and maybe training profile, uh, as this goes on, I expect that the impact will grow uh, more, uh, more broadly in the higher income areas. So BLS continues to produce monthly indicators that will give you as good a view as possible of the economy. Um, I'm sure you took notice of our May 8th employment situation report, uh, a truly historic report and a sad one, really. I, I, I had no joy in, in announcing those numbers. Uh, as you know, non-farm payroll employment uh, fell by a historic level of 20.5 million jobs in a single month, and the unemployment rate rose to the highest level that it has been since we established the unemployment on a seasonally adjusted basis back in 1948. I reported an unemployment rate of 14.7 percent. For those of you who read the fine print, you may have noticed that I think the unemployment rate is actually higher than that. Uh, there are seven and a half million people who are at home with pay but not working who we did not classify as furloughed because they did not give a reason for why they were at home. Um, and I think if we go back and this next month do a, a much better job, perhaps it's a more concentrated effort to find out why those people are at home, then if we added those seven and a half million to the 14.7%, we would have a 19.2% unemployment rate. The changes in these measures reflect the effects, obviously, of uh, COVID and of the stay-at-home orders. Uh, the number of unemployed, uh, unemployed persons rose by uh, 15.9 million to now 23.1 million in mid-April. Uh, obviously, we didn't pick up any of the newly unemployed in the last week and a half of April, though we will now pick up those, those numbers since I just mentioned we're in the field uh, right now doing the household survey. We also saw that the number of unemployed persons who reported being on temporary layoff, uh, it, it was, uh, was much higher than those were on, on permanent layoff. And when I briefed the Secretary of Labor on this, I said, you know, that's one of the few pieces of good news in this report. Unlike every other recession I've ever studied or been connected to, uh, the, where the number of permanently laid off individuals is always higher than the temporary laid off. Now we have just the opposite. In fact, we had 18.1 million people who are on temporary layoff. That is, they expect it to go, they expect to go back to the job that they left, uh, as opposed uh, to uh, 2.4 million uh, who are, uh, or rather a, a, an increase of 544,000 to 2 million of those who are on permanent layoff. The labor force participation rate decreased by 2.5%, and uh, the, more importantly, perhaps the employment population ratio decreased by a larger percentage than that. And, and that there was a, a, a very big increase in the number of people who are, were, were, are not in the labor force. That is, they're not looking for work, they've dropped out of the labor force. Hopefully those people will come back in um, and that would also augur well for the recovery. We, we saw employment declines in areas we had not seen employment other than just increases. Professional services dropped an enormous amount. Education and health services dropped. Healthcare employment declined by 1.4 million, uh, led largely by de dental offices, physicians offices, ambulatory care operations. The big, the big decrease, of course, was in retail trade, in um, leisure and hospitality, where we saw literally millions of jobs lost. Uh, overall, most of the gain in the in employment uh, since the 
uh, last recession was wiped out in that in the two months March and March and April, and we have now the same number of people working in the uh, in the economy as we're working roughly in 2010. <clears throat> so these numbers certainly reflect a very dire set situation, a historic set situation uh, as we as we navigate through this pandemic. As mentioned previously, although these are unprecedented time, the work of BLS continues. Uh, we will release data on state and metropolitan area employment and unemployment for April on May 22nd. So watch for that. We'll have good data on the state of Georgia. Uh, these data will provide a further glimpse into the impact of COVID-19 on state and large municipalities. Uh, we expect data on the number of job openings for March 2020 to be released in a few days. It is March 15th. That's the release day for the job openings and labor turnover survey. You know that that survey currently is two months in arrears, though we are making excellent strides to having that only be one month in arrear and to be coincident, roughly coincident with uh, in publication with the employment situation report. I'm very strongly in pushing for that because JOLTS is the only survey out there on labor demand. It'll be very important when the economy begins to recover. Uh, in April, the April 2020 Consumer Price Index was released a couple of days ago. The March 2020 data were first released during the uh, pandemic. Uh, and, they were, and we certainly had a lot of problems with the data collection uh, in that period of time, but now we're past where things are becoming a little bit more routine, but now we're seeing this just these enormous decreases in prices, both at the consumer level, at the at the at the producer level, and uh, and and uh, and with respect to exports and imports as well. Uh, that raises the question of short-term deflation that has definite uh, public policy implications. Those folks who are there at the bank working on monetary management will immediately know what that what that means. So I don't think in the long run we're looking at deflation. We certainly could be looking at a short run. Gasoline prices are leading everything. Um, gasoline prices fell, as you know, by 20.6% in April. They are uh, falling rapidly across the wholesale and retail horizon. Uh, there have been some increases. Uh, we have seen increases for food at home. It's a 2.6% increase in April the largest monthly increase in 45 years. The CPI, less food and energy, sometimes called core CPI, fell by the largest it's ever fallen, that's four tenths of a percent. Um, and that series dates back to 1957. It's the largest monthly decrease. BLS has a wealth of data that provides different parts of the story when seeking to understand the overall impact of the coronavirus, and I hope that we can encourage and support as much research in this area. Uh, my pledge to you is that we'll continue to uh, collect, produce, and get these data out on time, under budget, um, because I think it's so important for, the, for everyone, the general public most, most importantly, to have these data so that they know where they are. I mean, if it's a bad situation, how bad is it? We're, we're there to measure it objectively without a partisan uh, bone in us. So these are difficult times and I just want to conclude by saying that uh, we all need to work together to, to, get to, to get through this. You've heard that a million times over the past two months and it's absolutely true. Uh, but we're, we're there to do our, our work and I think without interruption we'll be able to do it. So I want to thank uh, the Atlanta Economic Council and the uh, committee and the uh, Atlanta NABE for giving me an opportunity to uh, stay at home, but yet still do this. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, and I hope we have time for some questions. And with that, Jessica, I'm gonna send it back to you. Thanks, Commissioner Beach, sorry. Um, trying to get the technology right. Thank you so much for your remarks. Um, several questions have, come in and we do have about uh, 25, 24 minutes for questions. And so um, sure. we'll go ahead and jump straight in. I'm gonna try to group them. Um, several have come in about reliability, measurement, changes in kind of estimation strategies. And so maybe we'll start there. Um, 
one of our audience members asks, is online data collection reliable? And if so, um, can't it be a big cost savings for the government going forward? Um, how, if, it, if it's not you know, considered reliable, how, how should policymakers um, kind of think about that going forward? Can you, speak, can you speak to the quality? Sure, sure. So online data collection provides tremendous cost savings if you're running a price index survey. Uh, just, it's just awesome, right? You don't have to have, uh, I think we have, don't hold me to this, but I think we have 400 people who work collecting prices in the 80, 80 price areas. And these are economic assistants that uh, make a good wage and they go around heroically in their, t in their cars and walk into businesses, oftentimes unwelcome. <laughs> And they collect the stuff. Um, now, if we could collect all of this remotely, we'd be in heaven. I can use all of that money. Maybe I can train those folks to do something else. I don't know, or maybe they can find a better job. But there are limitations. Uh, you can't hold something in your hands, see it, read the label in the back, get a sense of the tiny improvements that go into your narrative that go into the national office that help us do the, the hedonic tweaking we need for certain products. So, so yes, you do lose something, you do gain something, but you do lose something. Also, when a product is offered online, frankly, uh, we don't know whether the price that we're seeing is a price that we would call retail or a price that we would call loss leader. Um, and we have to be really, really careful with online. If we become too reliant on online, and here I'm arguing against myself, but if we become too reliant, we, 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 we may become captured by online providers. And uh, I don't think that's healthy for the price index mission. So I'm hoping that we can mix it up, um, have a lot more online. Yes, we've, this has been great for us. Uh, we're learning a lot about the, the strengths and weaknesses and combine that with a, a smaller on the ground presence. And, and I'll just say one more thing, it's a long answer, I'm sorry, but uh, it may anticipate other questions. We think that once we come out of this, fewer businesses are gonna want us to come into the store just because they're gonna be cautious about people walking into their store. If you're not a customer, you know, for, for some time, you may not be welcome, even though they know you're from the government, from BLS, and you're doing this important work. Thank you. Um, another question, how are you dealing with large, medium sized and small companies that enter bankruptcy? Um, and can you speak about the birth and death model and how that's working in this environment? Right. Uh, so, there are every month uh, businesses that simply just go out. These are called zero response businesses. That's a terrible term for a bankruptcy, right? But we use that term. They don't respond to us. Uh, and so we have to make a decision. Are these response respondents just, are they still there in business, just not responding to us? We obviously call them up. We try to find out. We send, we send people out. That's in the old days. Or are they out of business? Uh, if they're out of business, we have to then use that as an observation so that we can generalize from that particular observation to the universe and saying that there are more businesses that are out of business like this one. So it's, it's a survey result. And we handle that in a model. We have to do that through modeling. We handle that in a model called the birth death model the birth of businesses and the death of businesses. We run that every month. We have for many, many years. It's a very controversial model. It's the only piece of real modeling that we do in the employment survey. Well, this has been a real challenge for us because we don't know yet the extent to which we are having firms that are still in business but closed or out of business and closed. It's a big difference right there. Because if they're still in business and closed, they may have employees that are being paid, but not working. And for the purpose of the employment survey, if you're paid, but not working, that's a very different result than if you're not working and not being paid. 
Um, so we're, our model, thank, thank you for the question. I can now point you to a, 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 a dense document on our website describing everything we've done in the past 30 days to document changes to the birth death model. And I think the best answer now that you've got my little preface here is for you to go and read that. And if you don't think we've done the right thing, I would so appreciate uh, a letter to me saying this is or a letter or an email to me saying, I think you should have done this. I think you should have done that because we are wide open to suggestions on how to handle this pretty Im impossible problem. Thanks. Um, can you provide more detail on the food and beverage CPI and how that data was collected? Oh, okie doke. Uh, so the, um, a lot of the food and beverage, a lot of the food and beverage detail has to be collected in a, in an in-person format. Uh, you need to go in, look at, look at the menus, uh, look at selection prices, uh, take, uh, have an interview with the bartender, have an interview with the restaurant owner to find out where they are on their price uh, 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 horizon. So, you know, sometimes they'll shift their prices down to respond to supply issues or, or respond to local competition or shift it up or so forth and so on. And we've been doing that for, gosh, when did the CPI start? 1912. Um, and when it was used to uh, arbitrate labor contracts. Well, we are able to look at online menus and we're able to talk to some of the, on, uh, some of the vendors, uh, but a lot of the prices in the food and beverage uh, category uh, have been uh, projected for the April, April time period. We, had, we, had to, we have a procedure for non-response, which we use for one month, which if we have enough observations surrounding a non-response uh, category, a category in which we don't have enough respondents to actually publish, but we have enough or, or like, it's very similar, it's around that, that same category, we're able then to take the prior month's uh, data and project it into the current months. Um, it's, it, I don't allow that to go for more than one month, so we're not gonna be doing that next month. So if we can't collect enough detail in the food and beverage area, then those will not be published results. And just to point out, it's probably unlikely we will ever publish those results because you can't go back and reconstruct something that wasn't there. Uh, so so we'll, have, we'll have some hiatuses. Uh, I'm sure the modelers on this uh, call know exactly what they have to do with their indicator variables and to estimate what should have been there, you know, what wasn't there. Uh, but uh, we have some standards, and if we drop to the point where we can't meet the standards, then we won't be publishing the detail. Thanks. Um, another question, how will the cost of living adjustment be affected for Social Security and other programs? Is the plan to go with the best available data? Will there be biasing in one direction or another? Uh, so far, we don't think that our top line numbers have been significantly affected by COVID as to indicate a bias that has to be corrected. Um, so uh, that's the, that kind of was the message of the portion of my speech about gold standard, statistically reliable data. Uh, when we get to the point where, yeah, you know, the CPI is, we're only collecting a certain portion of it, and we definitely have a bias, then we'll have to address that. That will be a very public statement so that everybody knows what's going on. Nothing will be, nothing will be hidden here, and um, nor is it ever. So right now, let me just say uh, the, uh, the Lesperge indexes, which are the base year indexes, PPI and CPI, uh, those are fine. The Tornquist is fine. Uh, our con our cons consumer expenditure survey, uh, which isn't collected every month anyway, uh, but it, that is our sampling frame for, for the CPI. That's fine. Uh, all of the top line numbers are in good shape. 
That sounds great. So the next, I'm going to group together two questions. Um, one is about teleworking and the other is about gig workers. Um, the first question is, there's widespread speculation that many workers will continue to work from home indefinitely. Will the BLS seek to measure the extent of teleworking or related developments or do they already? Um, and the, then again, the second question. Um, recent le legislation expanded UI benefits to gig workers and the self-employed. Will the BLS be able to use this change to get a better sense of that size um, and type of worker? Are these individuals included in the unemployment rate and would they have been included pr prior to COVID? Can you speak about those, those two segments? Sure, sure. So we, uh, we think that uh, telework is, um, well, I, I agree personally that telework is going to be much more extensively and permanently used than it is right now. It, this, has a, this is a real challenge if you own a lot of office buildings uh, and people have been thinking about uh, how can they save on their overhead? Well, they're saving on their overhead right now. <laughs> There's a, it's a, that's, and, and you know, the biggest pro, the biggest office owner in the United States is the General Services Administration. I'd hate to be in their position right, right at this moment. So yes, we're in the field this month with very special questions about COVID and how you're working. So stay tuned. This is the first time we've actually added uh, some, a lot of questions to the consumer, uh, to, to the household survey We'll have some very interesting results that we've never published before. Um, o OMB and uh, the Office of uh, uh, Information and Regulatory Affairs that governs the U.S. statistical system was very, very supportive of Census and BLS in getting some new questions out into the field on this pandemic. Uh, with respect to gig workers, uh, as you know, we've been studying the contingent workforce, uh, the platform work for workforce for a long time. Our first study came out almost 20 years ago. Uh, and we published a, a controversial study in 2017 that it led us to uh, convene uh, through the National Academy of Sciences, a special committee to advise us on changes to that particular uh, survey. So that, that survey is going to be changed in the future, though it looks like our results in 2017 are holding up better than what would, what in view of, of subsequent research on gig workers than what, what was initially thought. Uh, but absolutely, the PUA program, the program for uh, those who are not insured through the UI system but are self-employed, um, yes, that's gonna be a big help to us. Uh, as you know, the UI system keeps very nice demographic and geographic information on those who qualify for benefits. And I'm hoping that they're doing the same thing with the PUA program. It's my understanding that they, that they are. Uh, these workers are considered uh, part of the labor force, and as a consequence, they are considered part of the unemployed population. So when we go into a household, we don't ask, are you on payroll or not? We ask, did you work in the last four weeks for pay or for profit? Um, and if they say yes, they are counted as in the labor force and employed. If they said no, we ask, did you look for work in the last four weeks? And if they say yes, we did, uh, are dead, then they're considered in the labor force and unemployed. So we're, 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 we're sweeping in every possible work arrangement that we can imagine through, through that line of questions. That sounds great. We do have one specific question, and I don't actually know the answer to this, so I'm going to um, throw this at you too. How did teachers fit into the unemployment situation? Are they, are they considered unemployed? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, there, uh, teachers fall into two big categories for us. There's state and local education, and there's private education. So we, we have those as two different uh, employment categories and NAICS breakout. Uh, if if a, a teacher answers the question, um, I am not working now, but I am employed, uh, which could very well be the, the most common answer, right? they're considered furloughed and therefore part of the unemployed population, even if they're receiving pay. Uh, the, the, the difference between being employed and not being employed is not pay, it's whether you're working for pay or profit. And so, uh, so they, would be, uh, they would be unemployed. If, if on the other hand, the, the teacher is uh, a nine-month employee, right? 
a lot of those used to be a lot of those in uh, in the teaching community and still are quite a few in private education then during the period of time when they are not working they could be unemployed if they're looking for work but they usually just fall out of it they just usually leave the labor force for, for three months and then re-enter the labor force for three months that's picked up in our seasonal adjustments that's helpful thank you um Will there be analysis released on the impact of the CARES Act on establishment and employment specifically? No. <laughs> uh, let, let me give you a little bit of the background on that. So uh, the Census Bureau proposed a set of questions on the, uh, on the CARES Act. Um, and this is a part of what they were going to do and they are doing in a, a different way through their new pulse surveys. These are short little surveys. Uh, and, the, and the Office of Management and Budget recommended that that not be permitted because then a statistical agency would be evaluating policy. Uh, and I, I think that's the wrong role for a statistical agency to perform. So uh, we just provide the data and we let others like the Council of Economic Advisors or people on this call evaluate uh, policy. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics never, never proposed that. We came kind of close in one of the questions that I added to the CPS. And so I pulled one of those questions out and you'll never know what it actually was. Uh, uh, we just really rigorously stay out of politics and policy. Uh, so, uh, so we won't be doing that. Um, how are revisions handled for the monthly jobs report? Uh, and this is in normal times, not just during COVID. Can you speak to that? Sure. So, uh, so each uh, each of the two subsequent months after the first publication of uh, the jobs report, we receive more information, which we classify by industrial or NAICS coding, employment and NAICS, NAICS coding. Um, that uh, new information is run through the sampling filters so that the sample adds up to our sampling frame which is the qcew and if we get if we get new information and that says well th that that those two businesses allow us to add thirty thousand more people to the payroll and then that's what we do that's the way it, that's the way sample and surveying works uh, so we do revisions they're usually less than fifty thousand per month this past month, we revised March by 264,000, which is the largest revision we've ever announced uh, in the history of that series, which goes back to 1939. Um, so, uh, so that's the way it works. We get additional information. It's either up or down. Once it goes through the formulas, we're taking the sample and generalizing to the entire universe or population in the United States of people who are working. So there's two questions here um, that I'm going to throw at you. Um, one is, um, what is your forecast on the shape of the employment recovery, a V, U, an L, a swoosh sign, square root, um, and then have any guesses on the UI claims tomorrow? Do you have thoughts on either of those? So, uh, so I, I know the UI claims number for tomorrow, so I, I, won't, I won't comment on that one way or the other. So what we're what we're seeing uh, really is the unfolding of the labor market damage. Um, could we have avoided it? No, I don't. You know, I'm one of those who think we we couldn't have avoided it because we needed to respond to the pandemic. Uh, it's for people in public policy to to argue what we should do now with respect to restarting the economy. Uh, but we but I can tell you this with certainty that the longer the economy is largely shuttered in key areas, the deeper the damage to the labor market will be. And is the trade-off acceptable? That, that, um, I'll leave that to others. I have my own personal views, but I'll leave that to others. But, but that is clearly the case. So we're, uh, we're hoping that uh, the, the COVID-19 is tamed in some fashion so that we simply can tolerate it with therapy until we have a vaccine, um, at which point we're probably free of it until it mutates into something else. Um, and um, that's great, but we're probably into this 
slowdown for some time. Uh, the, the argument of a, of a V-shape is that there is, in fact, the capacity to come back. We can bring everybody back into a workforce. We can, we can have everybody in subways. We can have people in crowded areas. It's, you know, that's the way we live and work. I don't know that that's possible. So uh, I think that kind of recovery, while maybe in the distant future is, is possible, I, I, I find a less credible than the slower style of recovery. By the way, I have a, a view, I've already spoken on this else, elsewhere, that this is not a recession, it's an economic collapse and we should just take our recession thinking and put it to one side and look very quick, freshly at this. You know, one of the things that makes this so different is that we have uh, nearly a tenfold, um, a tenfold increase in those who are on temporary layoff as opposed to permanent layoff. We just don't see that in a recession. It's just the opposite. So uh, yes, it, the, the dating committee from MBER will come back and put a recession label on this. And I think that's very appropriate. But I think we need to be creative in our thinking right now and uh, maybe step outside of the recession paradigm to think about different ways we could bring this economy back. Great. Um, another question, thinking about what, what, will, what will we see going forward? Do you think inflation will increase notably due to um, supply shocks? Do you have thoughts on the path of inflation? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a lot like uh, Francis Amasa Walker, uh, 19th century, late 19th century director of the census and one of the founders of the American Economic Association who had a hard time understanding tariffs and the changes in prices of money when associated with that. And he said, every time I think about this, I have to lay down on the, late, on the nearest park bench and wait for this whole feeling of confusion to pass. Um, and I, that's the way I feel about inflation. You know, I just, it's, uh, it's such a mystery to me. Um, I think prices can go down and then they can come up in supply and demand basis, but it seems inflation is largely an expectational phenomenon. Um, and if we are operating at such low capacity and the economy comes back, why would there be upward pressures on prices for a long time? So it's a, it, you know, I'll leave that to the experts in this area, um, which I'm sure there are many on this call. That sounds great. So we're we're almost at the um, at the end of our time, but I wanted to pose one more question to you, just about for the non-experts on the call. Um, how is the BLS increasing visibility and tutorials on your site to help professionals that aren't in the financial area or that aren't you know professional economists understand what's going on in our economy? Right. Resources. So, yeah. So there's quite a few ways of accessing our data. Uh, first off, we publish a, a blog. It's called the Commissioner's Blog. Uh, sometimes I write for it. It's always, it's always over my name, but uh, others who know a lot more write, write, write for it more frequently. I think that has a reputation for being a very accessible point of entry for our data and understanding the data. Uh, we have a, a, a video series for uh, uh, children of all ages, right? Of everybody who wants to understand something, uh, we have it. We have we have it on inflation, on the CPI, on measuring employment. What is the unemployment rate? Um, we have a number of pamphlets which are available also on our website or available through our regional offices, and um, and then of course we have probably the best reputation in the federal government for answering the telephone, which we're continuing to do. By the way, if you call the BLS number to get a, an answer to a question, you'll reach a, a live person and that will be answered maybe on the spot, more than likely within a couple of hours. So um, I hope the general public feels very at ease in interacting with us because that's why we're in business. Thank you so much, Commissioner Peach. We've really appreciated um, your time today, your insights. Um, I would just like to thank also all of all of the audience that joined in. I saw several names from the Atlanta area that would have been at our in-person meeting had you come down to Atlanta um, this May. And so thank you everyone, both Atlanta Economics Club members and non-members for, for joining us. We're really happy to have you. And Chris, if you're still on the line, should I pivot back to you to close yes, us sure. out? Yeah, thanks Jessica. And I wanna thank the Atlanta Economics Club for co-hosting this event. 
Uh, the program is copyrighted 2020 by the National Association for Business Economics with all rights reserved. Thank you all again. Uh, you may now disconnect. This does conclude the event.